Hello, I'm Anika from Made to Sew, and welcome to our beginner's dressmaking tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be working with you to make a McCall's skirt, following this pattern, which is the 3830. Now, you don't necessarily have to follow this pattern. Hopefully, you'll pick up some tips and techniques for your sewing along the way anyway. But if you would like to follow us sewing this pattern, you're more than welcome to do so. So the first thing that you're going to need is to purchase one of these patterns. In a second, we're going to be going through with you the size that you're going to need to be purchasing. And we're going to show you how to take the measurements on your individual body. We're also going to be discussing the fabrics and the notions that you're going to need. And then we'll move on to working with the pattern and actually creating the skirt that we're showing you here. Now this skirt comes in a number of different lengths, from sort of an ankle length through to a mini skirt length. It's really up to you which of the lengths you want to make. And the top of this skirt at the waist is finished with a facing, which you can see on the skirt here sits on the inside of the skirt. Now, we have made a corresponding tutorial where we actually show you how to draft your own waistband if you would prefer to position a waistband onto the top of your skirt. The link to the corresponding tutorial will be in the description box below. Let's start by choosing the size that you're going to need to make your skirt in. One thing I want to point out is that the sizes on the pattern envelope are not the same as the high street. So you will not be making the same size skirt as you would in the high street. Now you're going to need to think about the size that you're going to be prior to purchasing the pattern. Some patterns will come with all of the sizes included in the envelope. But for this pattern, one envelope includes the sizes 6 to 12 and the other envelope includes the 12 to 18. So you're going to need to know which envelope you need to purchase prior to purchasing the pattern. So to do that, you're going to need to take some measurements. On the back of the pattern envelope, the measurements are required are the waist and the hip. Now the waist measurement is at always at the smallest point of your figure. You can see on the mannequin here where the skirt is sitting. It's generally around the belly button. And it should be where, if you were to put your hands and put them on your waist, where you automatically put them. If you want some help with measuring, we do have a tutorial that shows you how to take these measurements. The other measurement you're going to need to take is the hip measurement. And I think this is one that confuses people sometimes. It is not over the hip bones. The hip measurement is over the fullest part of the figure, so the bottom. And it is generally about 8 inches, 20 centimetres down from the waist. So it's over the fullest part of the bottom and the thighs. You want to take these measurements snugly with a tape measure and make sure they're straight all the way around. Once you know the size, it, size or sizes that you're going to be, you do not have to be the same size for the waist and the hip. You may find that you are, are a different size and I will show you how we amend the pattern with that later on in the tutorial. One thing I really want to point out here and, and to try and help you understand is that the measurements that you are, you are looking at now, we are looking at now, our body measurements, are the measurements that the pattern company think you should be to wear that size. They will have incorporated something that's called ease into those measurements. Now, ease is something that you need so that you can wear a garment. Because this isn't a garment to be made in stretchy fabric, the woven fabric needs to have a bit of room so that you are able to sit down. So, as an example, if we take a size 12, the hip of a size 12 is 36 inches. So if you measured your hip at 36 inches, you would put your hip in a size 12. If we go to the bottom of the pattern envelope here, and it talks about the finished garment measurements, and it says the measurement at the hip line for a size 12 in the finished garment is 40 inches. That's a difference of four inches. So you've got four inches, which is 10 centimeters, extra room for you to be able to move in the skirt and for you to be able to sit down. I sometimes find that the amount of ease they add 
might be a little bit too much. And this really depends on you. It depends on how you like your clothes to fit. So what I would suggest is that perhaps you go and get yourself a skirt out of your wardrobe that you like the fit of. Make sure that it isn't a stretchy fabric. Make sure that it's a woven fabric so something that isn't going to stretch. And take a measurement across the hip of that pattern, or of that skirt, sorry. And then you could compare that to the finished garment measurements. And that might give you a better idea of the size that you want to be in. Some people like their clothes to be a little bit more fitted than others. And as I said, the best way to do that is to look at what you've already got and a skirt that you already like. The other thing that it helps us here with the finished garment measurements is the back length from the natural waistline. So it tells you how long the skirt will be on you, which is great because sometimes the pictures on the front don't give us much of an idea. So you could measure down from your waist the length of the skirts here so that you can make a decision as to which of the views, view A to view E, that you would like to make. And it also gives us a bottom width. So the circumference at the bottom of the skirt, which probably isn't something you're going to really need to worry about. While we're talking about the finished garment measurements, one thing I wanted to point out was that on this pattern, we're lucky enough for it to tell us the finished measurements at the hip line on the back of the envelope. But you will also find those on the paper pattern. And you can see these arrows here. The arrows here at the hip line give us those measurements. So on patterns where they're not listed on the back of the envelope, you need to look at the tissue paper with the pattern on it. And you'll often get arrows or you'll get a circle with a cross through it. There'll be something with some numbers that will tell you the finished garment measurement when you have made it. So hopefully you feel a little bit more confident about choosing the size and the view of the skirt you wish to make. We now need to have a look at the fabrics. The next thing is to think about the fabric that you want to make your skirt in. Now on the back of the pattern envelope, there are some suggested fabrics. And it's always useful to have a read of what the pattern wants you or is suggested that you make the skirt in. Now here we've got cotton and cotton blends. So you could go, this is a Liberty cotton here. You could go with a cotton print. Um, this is a Liberty Tana lawn fabric. It is quite lightweight though. Um, so it may require a lining um, or a backing fabric. Um, another option would be the, the fabric that we actually did the skirt in, and that's very similar to this black fabric here, which is actually a cotton with an elastane. So it's about 98% cotton, 2% elastane. That gives it a little bit of stretch, but it won't be difficult to work with, so don't worry. If you are a beginner, I would really recommend that a cotton's a great place to start. Um, it's relatively easy to work with. Don't choose anything with a pattern that needs matching either. Um, you're welcome to use a pattern such as this, it's really, really random, or perhaps at like the top I'm wearing, where it's rather random. But anything like stripes or geometric shapes that need matching, I would try and stay clear of when you're first learning. Now the next thing is a linen blend, so that would be a fabulous option as well, um, and really nice for the summer. And a wool crepe, now this fabric here is a wool crepe, which has got a little bit more drape, so it's a little bit, it's not as stiff as the cotton. And then other options are lightweight woolens, wool blends. So this is a wool blend here, or I've got this tartan, which again I wouldn't recommend if you are a complete beginner, but a wool blend or a lightweight woolen is again a really great place to start for a beginner because the fabric's um, rather supportive, it is easy to work with, it's not going to slip around anywhere, it's not going to move, um, so that again, that or a cotton would be a great place to start. And the last thing they've suggested on here are synthetic leathers and suede. And we've got this fabulous leather here. Um, again, if you are perhaps a little bit more advanced with your dressmaking, then you could try working with um, leathers and synthetic suede. But again, as a beginner, I would recommend that you try and stick with the woolens and the cottons as a starting point. So once you've chosen the fabric that you're planning on using for your skirt, you're going to need to think about how much of that you need.
And this is again where the back of the pattern envelope comes in handy. On the back of the pattern envelope, you should have the different options for the skirt. So in this case, we've got view A to view E. And next to those, you have got the width of the fabric that you're buying. So when you go into a fabric shop, you're going to need to ask them how wide the fabric is that you're buying. And on the left-hand side of the pattern, that is in inches, and on the right-hand side, that's in centimetres. So you've got 45 inches, which is 115 centimetres, 54 inches, which is 140 centimetres, and 60 inches, which is 150 centimetres. You're then going to need to use the table to work out how much fabric you need for the size that you're planning on making in your skirt. And that's going to give you a good starting point. I'd always recommend, especially if you're a beginner, to perhaps buy a little bit more, just in case you make a mistake, or in case you have trouble with anything or want to, or want to practice with your fabric. So if you can, buy a little bit more just in case. Now you should know how much fabric you need to purchase to make your individual skirt. You also need to get a few other supplies in order to create the skirt. One of those is interfacing, and we'll have a little chat about the kinds of interfacing you should be looking for in a second. The amount of interfacing you need is generally listed below under the view of the skirt that you're making. So again, you know how much interfacing you need for the view and the size of the skirt you're planning to make. The other thing that's listed on the back of the pattern envelope are the notions that you need. Now the notions are all the little bits and pieces that you need in order to make the skirt. So the first thing that we need for those is thread. I tend to work with a Gutenberg polyester sew all thread, but it really doesn't matter, it's up to you. And you'll only need the 100 meter spool for making the skirt. You again want to choose a color that matches your fabric as closely as possible. The next thing the pattern requests is a seven inch zipper. Now the pattern is going to show you how to put in a standard zipper, but if you're following along with this tutorial, I'm going to be sharing with you how to put in an invisible zipper. I personally think that as a beginner, you get a much better outcome with an invisible zipper. So we're going to purchase an invisible zipper in a similar color to your exterior fabric as possible. And I think the smallest length you can buy of these is eight inches, and that is absolutely fine. If you're planning on perhaps getting into dressmaking and making a lot of things, I would recommend purchasing an invisible zipper foot for your sewing machine. Although you can put these in without an invisible zipper foot, it does make the process much easier and it will be really quick and simple for you to do. Finally, it asks for one hook and eye. So you generally have to buy these in a pack. And to be honest, if you don't want to apply one to the skirt, it, it doesn't matter. They can't, some people can find them a little bit fiddly, but it's always good to have a little pack of them around in case you need one. Now you need to make a decision as to the interfacing that you want to use on your project. It's really important that you do purchase interfacing and use it where a pattern has asked you to. It will provide the required amount of stiffness for a project to work and for it to be secure and just look good when it's done. So you've got a couple of different options. Generally speaking, you'll be able to purchase black or white interfacing. You need to choose a color that will go with your exterior fabric the best and that doesn't come through the exterior fabric. You also generally have got iron in or sew on interfacings. Um, for something like this, you really probably want to go with an iron on. It just will be easier to work with when you're positioning that onto your facing. And then you've got a variety of different weights. Now, generally speaking, you want to choose the weight of the interfacing that's the most similar to the weight of the fabric. But for something like this, I, I would suggest a lightweight interfacing. You don't need anything too bulky on your facing. And if you're undecided between perhaps two weights of interfacing, I would generally go with the lighter weight one. You never want it to come out too stiff or cumbersome. Now, you can also purchase what's called a woven or a non-woven interfacing. Woven interfacing is generally more difficult to get hold of. But if you can purchase it, I would 100% recommend it. Woven interfacing feels much more like a cotton. And this is a really lightweight cotton fabric with a sort of sticky gluey side that I can adhere to my exterior fabric.
So if you can find woven, it will operate in a more of a similar way to the exterior fabric. And the one thing you must always remember is that if you're working with a woven interfacing, you need to cut out the pattern on the same grain line as the exterior fabric. Now these are sometimes difficult to get hold of. So if you go to your local store and they only have non-woven, then that's fine for this occasion. But if you do find a woven interfacing, I would really recommend it. The non-woven interfacings are more of a sort of pulp um, that's actually been sort of bonded together and then it's got the sticky side. So it doesn't really act in a way that fabric would. Now we should be ready to take the pattern out of the envelope and start working with the sizing that you're planning to make. Take the pattern out of the pattern envelope and simply roughly cut out the pattern pieces that you require. Now for the skirt, you're going to need the front and the back and also two of the pieces for the facing. You've got a back facing and a front facing. And the little booklet that comes with that will clearly show you the pieces that you need. You may also, also wish to cut out the piece number five for the carrier. I always like to refer to this, especially when you start making something that has more pieces or a greater number of pieces, because it's often good to actually tick these things off to make sure that you have cut out everything that you require. Now, I personally prefer to cut it out roughly to start with, so I'm not cutting along the black lines, I'm simply roughly cutting out the pieces so that I can separate them from each other. We're then going to have a little look at the fitting and pattern cutting of this in a second. But one thing that I do like to do is actually to trace these out onto thicker paper. That can be standard paper, that can be tracing paper, or it could be a pattern paper such as this dot and cross paper. And this is a little bit more hard wearing. The problem that you'll find with the tissue paper that the patterns come on is that it's very, very fine. And after a couple of uses, it will disintegrate. You may wish to make more than one skirt for yourself, especially if you really like it. And you may have friends or family members that also would like you to use one that may be a different size to you. So I tend to trace out the size that I'm going to be working on. Or if you're perhaps between sizes, We'll trace out a couple of those sizes and I will show you in a second, working on the paper pattern, how we actually choose the correct size and how we make any pattern adjustments. So I'd like you to trace this out now if you're planning to do so. If not, you're more than welcome to work on your tissue paper. That's not a problem at all. When you trace the pattern out onto the paper, I recommend using a pencil so that you get a really fine and sharp line. You also want to take across all of the markings. Now, what markings do you need to look out for? Things like these little triangles, which are referred to as notches, you need to mark all of those. You'll need to mark your dart and the circles on the dart. You'll also need to mark things such as your waistline, your lengthening and shortening lines, and the hem that you're planning on doing. So you'll need to trace out all of those things. As I mentioned before, if you're between a couple of sizes, I would recommend drawing out the few sizes that you are between, and then we'll have a look at how we're going to be fitting that in a second. Start by tracing the pattern pieces out onto paper, especially if you're planning on wanting to make different sizes of the pattern, and it allows us to make all of the changes we need to make here. I would make sure that you add all of the details as what pattern it is, the pattern piece that it is, the grain line, the darts, the notches, everything that you'll need for using it today and for perhaps remembering things in the future. Now we're going to be working with a size 8 at the waist and a size 10 at the hip. It doesn't matter what sizes you're working with, but I just wanted to show you that you don't have to be the same size throughout the pattern piece. So how do you know where the hip of the pattern is? Well, on the front of your skirt pattern, you will see these two arrows and a variety of figures. Now the figures here are the finished garment measurements, which are also listed on the back of the envelope. Now I would make sure that you draw a little line here, just in pencil, across to your side seam, so that you know where the hip is on the side of your skirt. 
Now, unfortunately, the same measurements aren't included for the waist, so we don't know what the finished size of the garment waist is. However, I can show you how to find that out if you're interested in knowing. So what do you need to do? Well, rather than actually taking a measurement across the top of the skirt here, we're going to need to work with our facings. The reason being is that the top edge of the skirt has got written ease. Now this means that this area is going to actually be eased or shrank to fit the facing. So we're going to need to work with the facing instead. Now, taking your front and your back facing, you're going to need to find the measurements across the waist area of the facing. Now, we know that the area along the top of the facing here with the notch, and this is your front facing, and this is the back with the two notches, this is what's going to join to the top of the skirt. So this is our waist area of our facing. Now, what we can do is take a ruler and we're working with seam allowance of 1.5 centimetres or 5 eighths of an inch. And this should be listed in the pattern so that you know that, but most commercial patterns will work with the same seam allowances. We're going to measure down from this top edge, 5 eighths of an inch, 1.5 centimetres using the ruler. And we can mark that on, and I would do this in pencil. I've just done this in a red pen so that you can clearly see it. And you're going to need to pivot the ruler with the curve of the waistband. And you want to draw that along the top edge on both the back and the front facing. Now, on the front facing, the front edge is going to be cut on the fold. So there isn't any seam allowance that you need to take off here, but there is on the side edge. So I'm working with my size eight, and I've measured in from the size eight marking the five eighths, 1.5 centimetres, and I'm going to put a marking there as well. So my stitching line is very clearly the red dotted line here. The amount on this side is seam allowance and the amount on the top is seam allowance as well. Now for the back facing, you're going to have two seams. We've got a side seam and we've also got a back seam. So again, from your size eight marking, you would measure in your five eighths, 1.5 centimetres, and draw your dotted line. Now for the back, the pattern has almost done that for you already because the centre back line that they have drawn is 5 eighths, 1.5 centimetres from the back edge of the pattern here. So that's ready done for you. Once you've drawn these on nice and clearly, we're going to take a tape measure. Take a tape measure with the markings facing down onto the paper. And we're going to position the tape measure upright. And this is the easiest way, or the most accurate way, should I say, for measuring curves. And we're going to simply position that around on the line, and you're going to pivot it around the facing. And you can take your measurement. So it's six inches for the back facing. And I've already done my one on the front as well. I measured from the center front here to the edge here and it was six and three eighths of an inch. It really doesn't matter if you're working in inches or centimeters here. I would suggest that you work in the figure that you understand the finished measurement of. So if you understand your waist measurement in inches or in centimeters, I would say stick with that for this part of the tutorial at least. Now, now we know that our back facing from here to here is six inches. Now this is only half of our back facing, center back to the side seam. So we need to time six by two, which gives us a finished measurement of 12 inches. And so from one side seam to the other side seam across the back of the body, the back facing will measure 12 inches. The same for the front, from the center front to the side seam was six and three eighths times that by two is 12 and three quarters. Now this is where it's really important that you do do things in pencil because the thick marker that I'm working may have actually added a little bit to my figures. Now we know our front finish measurement and our back finish measurement. And although, as I said previously, we're working with the facing, if you remember correctly, the waistband is going to be eased 
to fit these. So this is the finished size of our garment. So we need to add together our front and our back to get our waist measurement size. And we get 24 and 3 eighths for a size eight. If we refer back to the pattern envelope, we can see the body measurements waist for a size eight was 24 inches. So therefore they have added three eighths of ease for a little bit of room. So if you have any queries at all with what waist size to put yourself in, I would have a little look and complete this measurement and then you can compare that to perhaps a skirt you have in the wardrobe or to your waist measurement. Now we know we're happy with the size 8 because of the measurements that we took from the facing and we're going to be completing a size 10 at the hip. A couple of things to point out here is that you don't just have to be jumping one size difference. It may be that you're an 8 in one area and perhaps a 12 or a 14 at the hip or it may be the other way around. You may be larger at the waist than at the hip. The other thing to point out is that perhaps you are really between the sizes. So you may not be an eight or a 10, you may be a size nine, and that's not a problem at all. All you would do is actually mark in between the two lines for the eight and the 10, if you were a size nine. Now to move between an eight and a 10, we're going to use a French curve. And we're gonna be sitting the curve on the eight line at the waist area, and we need to remember that we're back on the 10 line down on the side seam where our hip starts. And obviously we took our little dotted line across from here to the side seam. So we can really see where we need to be a size 10. And with a French curve, it's just a case of trying to find the right point of the curve. It can take a little bit of practice to just fiddle with it and make sure that you're happy with the shape of the curve that you're working with. Once you're happy with that, you can take your pencil and you can draw that in. And I'm using my red pen so that you can clearly see the changes that I've made there. So we started off at the size eight and we moved to the size 10. And as I said, if you were jumping more than one size, it's not a problem. You would ideally use a curve. If you haven't got a curve, you could simply use a pencil and do little fine strokes to gradually blend them together. And you just want to make sure that it's smooth. It's always smooth whenever you're doing these adjustments. Now, to, you also need to do the same on the back side of your skirt pattern. So how do you know where the hip is on the back? Because we don't have the same feature that we do on the front. Well, probably the easiest way to work this out is to measure up from the hem of the skirt, perhaps your cut here for E, or one of your lengthen and shorten lines, and do exactly the same on the back, and you can draw another line in pencil across for where the hip of the back of the skirt is. Then you want to use the French curve again, and you want to try and use the same part of the curve, so that you've got the same shape of the curve on the front side as well as on the back side. It will mean that they go together better. And again, you can draw that on with your pencil. And I've done that with my red pen, as you can see here. Now, once you're happy with the side seam that you sorted out and you know that the size, so we're going from an eight at the waist to a 10 at the hip is correct, then we're pretty much done. The other thing that you may want to change is that you may wish to lengthen or shorten the pattern. Now this is if perhaps you're petite or very tall and you may wish to make some changes. However, because this pattern has got numerous length options and it's a straight skirt, so it doesn't have the same shaping, this isn't really something that you overly need to worry about in this item. However, if you would like to learn how to lengthen or shorten something, then please follow our link in the description box below to our lengthening or shortening video. Now I'm going to be working with skirt C for this tutorial because I want to be able to show you how to sew a vent as well. So now it's time for me to actually cut this out. And I'm going to be cutting this out around my drawn lines. I'm going to be cutting it out along C for my length. And I'm going to be working with my size 10 most of the time 
and up to my size eight at the waist. Cut around your patterns. And remember that you don't want to be cutting on any of the dotted lines that you drew. They're the stitching lines. So we don't need to worry about them now. They were just to work out the sizing that we wanted to use. Another thing to point out is that for the facing, I'm going to be working with a size eight because that's what I'm working with at the waist of my pattern piece. If you found you made a lot of changes to this area, you may wish to actually put your facing onto your pattern and make sure that you get the same curve going on here. If you've had a drastic change, perhaps between a few different sizes. Cut out all of the pieces so that we're ready to add them onto fabric. Take the fabric that you're working with for the skirt and I would recommend that you pre-wash your fabric using the same method that you plan to use when you have finished with the skirt and actually want to wash the skirt. This will prevent any shrinkage. Then you will need to give it a good iron with some steam. And I'm going to be folding mine in half so that I'm cutting two layers at once. The right side of my fabric is going to be in the center and I'm going to be folding it so that the selvage edges are going to be together. Now, if you're unsure of what a selvage edge is, then follow the link to our corresponding tutorial in the description box below. Now, with regard to the right side of the fabric, it really doesn't matter. If you're uncertain about which is the right side of your fabric, then just choose the one that you would like to work with. That's the most important thing, is that you're choosing the right side that you want to work with. Now we're working with a plain fabric and I would recommend using a plain fabric or a pattern that is random enough that it doesn't require matching. And therefore we can cut this out in a double layer. Fold the fabric in half with the right sides together and we're going to match up the selvages along the edge here. And you want to pin the selvages together, keeping everything nice and flat. And placing your pins randomly along the selvage edge, keeping everything nice and flat and smooth. You can always give this another iron now if you would like to. Now it's time to place your pattern onto your fabric. Whether you're working with the paper pattern, so you traced it out onto paper like we've done here, or you're working with the original tissue paper pattern, the same rules apply. Now we're going to start with the front of the skirt. Now the front of the skirt is, needs to be cut on the fold of the fabric, centre front on fold. And you see the arrows actually point in to the edge of the pattern. Therefore, this edge of the pattern needs to be positioned right on top of the folded edge, which is why we needed to cut this out in half, because there was a fold somewhere in the pattern. However, for most things, you'll find that you can cut them out by doubling the fabric like we've done here, because it makes it quicker. The only time I wouldn't advise it is if you're working with a print or a pattern that needs matching. So we've pinned this, matching this edge directly along the fold. Now you've got these two types of grain lines. So we've got one with the centre front on fold, the other one where we've just got a simple arrow that says grain line, and this is the back of our pattern. Now this grain line also needs to be straight on the fabric. So we're going to take a tape measure or a ruler, and we're going to measure it. Now you want to measure from a stable area of the fabric. So rather than sort of the fluffy edge, I'm going to be measuring this fabric from just before the selvage border. Somewhere that will be consistent all the way down the selvage edge of the fabric. And the other thing to point out is that if you have folded this in half correctly, the folded edge of the fabric will also be the grain line. So if you are closer, to the folded edge, you could measure from the grain line to the fold instead. 
So I'm gonna be measuring from the selvage for this one. And I like to move my pattern pieces slightly so that I get an even number. So I've moved that service so slightly so that it's directly on 10. And then I'm using some pattern weights to hold this nice and flat. Now you need to measure once at the top of the grain line and once at the bottom to make sure that everything is lined up and it all is going to match. I tend to start by pinning the four corners of the pattern and then smooth the pattern out using my weights and position my pins along the edges in the seam allowance. You really don't need that many, you just need enough to make it sit nice and flat while you're cutting it out. Now, these are little weights that um, somebody made for me, but you, you don't need anything fancy, you know, tins from the kitchen will do, anything that's going to hold it down and keep it nice and flat. If you are new to sewing, I do have a tutorial on actually how to position your pins into the fabric that might help. You can follow that in the description box below. A couple of other things to think about. If you're working with a print or a pattern, and as I mentioned previously, you would want this to be a random print or pattern so that you don't need to match anything. But it may be a directional print, so there may be a top of the print. So for example, in this print, you've got trees, and you would want to have your head at the top here with this coming down the body like so. Now this is what's referred to as a nap layout, okay? So the other way of describing this is velvet. In one direction, velvet is nice and smooth to the touch. In the other, it isn't, it's rather rough. So, what you need to do with this is to make sure that all your pattern pieces are in the same direction with the head of the body at the same point. So, as I've laid out the two skirt pieces here, this would be correct. The waist is up here, coming down the fabric. So you would constantly think about where your head was and lay everything with the head at the top and the body pieces sitting in that direction. I tend to work with a nap layout whenever I can. If I've got enough fabric, I will follow it because you can find with some plain fabrics that if you were to turn one piece up the other way, that it wouldn't quite match. Maybe be a different color, a little bit more shiny or, or matte or whatever, but you can have a problem with plain fabric. So I tend to, if I've got enough fabric, I will work with this layout and I will make sure that the head of all of my pieces, whether that be the waist or the top of all of the pieces, should I say, is at the top of the fabric coming down. So everything's in the same direction. One last thing I wanted to mention is that in the little booklet that comes with the pattern, you will see this whole big amount of space on cutting layouts. Now, these, what this is telling you is that this is informing you of how to fold your fabric and how to position your pattern pieces onto your fabric for optimum usage of fabric. However, you do not have to follow this. And I'll be honest with you, I never look at this. I will just have my fabric and I will lay it out as I require, usually following my nap layout. So the top or the head of my body is on one side of my fabric and all my pattern pieces are in the same side. If I don't have enough fabric and I have to flip a piece, so perhaps for this skirt, I need to put the waist seam down the bottom here, then I will just hold up my fabric and the light in both directions and check that it isn't a different color if I have it in different directions, it isn't too shiny or whatever. So I tend to like to roll up my fabric so that it makes it easy for me to work with, especially if you haven't got a very large table. Now we've got the two remaining pieces to pin on, is our back facing and our front facing. Now the back facing I've already pinned on. We, it is not to be cut on the fold, however the grain line is straight. So rather than trying to measure this, I'm actually using the folded edge. And I'll simply cut down the fold there to create two pieces for that. Now the front facing is to be cut on the fold. And it should sit like so, if I were to go by the pattern piece in front of me. However, this is a very good example of a nap layout that we were discussing earlier. Because the head of my body for the skirt pieces here and for the back facing is at this 
top edge of my fabric and it wouldn't be for my front facing. Which could be a problem if you wanted to be, obviously this is on the inside, but if you wanted everything to be perfect and correct, then this wouldn't be quite right, especially with a print. So what are we going to do about it? Well, you can simply turn the piece over and we will still then match up the folded edge. And now the head of my front facing is in line with everything else. And we can use the weight and simply pin this on. Now it's time to cut out around the pattern pieces. And you're going to need to do this for the front, the back, and the front facing and the back facing. Now you can either use a pair of scissors or some people prefer to use a rotary cutter. And that's not a problem at all. With a rotary cutter, you will need a protective mat to protect your table. If you're choosing to work with scissors, I tend, the tip that I really have is to try and keep the pattern to the left of the scissors at all times. And you should find that you can get a closer cut this way. You also want to try and keep everything as flat as possible, all of the time. Just keep everything nice and flat. And don't worry if your edges aren't perfectly neat. I know that's the biggest thing, one of the biggest things I get asked in my beginner's classes is, oh, it doesn't look perfect. Don't worry about it. If they're not perfectly straight, it really doesn't matter. One thing to remember is that we placed our back facing on the fold because this was in line and true with our grain line. However, we don't want this to be on the fold. So we're going to need to cut this folded edge here. You only want to do this for the back facing though. Do not do this to the front or the front facing because these are supposed to be cut on the fold. I've now cut out all of my pieces out of the fabric. My back, my front on the fold, my front facing on the fold, and my back facing. Now I need to complete some markings because I need to take the markings that are on the pattern paper onto the fabric. These include the darts and the little notches. Now we're going to need to copy the markings that are on the pattern paper onto the fabric. That includes our darts and our notches. Now, because this is a beginner's project, I would recommend that obviously most of you are working with cotton or a rather simple fabric, so you should be okay to use a dressmaking carbon paper to copy all of your markings across and a tracing wheel. However, if you don't have one of these, that's not a problem at all. I would recommend that you do tailor's tacks and thread tracing, which I have two videos on how to do, and I'll put a link to that in the description box below. You want to make sure that all of the markings that are on your pattern paper also go onto the fabric. We're going to be using tracing dressmakers carbon paper and a tracing wheel to complete this. But if you prefer to complete thread tracing and tailor's tacks, then you're more than welcome to. And we'll put a link to the tutorials on how to do that in the description box below. Now, we need to mark the darts. And what we're going to do for that is to place our carbon paper with the carbon side facing up. So this is the sort of the dirty side. And using the tracing wheel, we're going to simply wheel along the drawn lines of the darts. Just like so, and the same on the other side. Now you do need to press relatively firmly, but not too hard. If you want to protect your table underneath, it might be good to put a mat or something underneath this. And you should be left with clear markings on your fabric. And if you remember, this is the wrong side of your fabric that we are marking because the right sides were together when we cut this out. Another thing that can be good to mark with the darts, and this is if you're new to sewing, is the end point. I sometimes like to do a horizontal 
line across the end of the darts so that when you're sewing this you really know where to stop. The other marks that we need to do are the notches. You can mark these as little V's if you would like, but I personally tend to just draw a line with the wheel straight through the centre of the V from the point to the centre. I find that that's a little bit clearer and easier for me to do. And you'll want to do as many as you see on the paper. So we've got two there. You will also need to mark the notch for the side of the back. And there are two notches for the centre back. Now, generally speaking, the notches increase as you work your way around the garment. So they'll start with sort of one notch at perhaps the side on this occasion, and then we've got two notches for the back. The same on the waistband, there'll be one notch on the front waistband, two notches on the back. The other thing that we've got here is a circle, and this dictates where the end of the zip will be. Now I personally tend to ignore these, especially because we're going to be putting in an invisible zipper, not a standard zipper. However, if you do have any circles anywhere else, how I generally mark a circle is by completing an X through the centre of this. Now if you are completing the vent at the bottom of the skirt, you will need to mark your stitching line here. And you may also find it useful to mark your fold line. I'm going to leave you to complete the same markings on the front of the skirt. You should have the dart, the notch at the waist seam, and the notch for the side seam. You will also need to complete the markings for the facing. And we've got two notches for the back waistband, one notch for the side, another notch for the side, and one notch for the front waistband. And these notches will match up with the notches on the back and front skirt waistbands when we're putting this together. Once you have marked the first side, you will then need to mark the second side, which is currently where the pattern piece is sitting on. Now to do that, you're going to need to take off the pattern piece. So remove your pins, but keep the two layers of fabric together. I tend to like to put a few pins, you don't need all of them, but just enough to hold the two pieces together so that they don't move. Now back to the carbon paper, you should be able to turn this over now so that the side with the original markings is facing up, the side that hasn't got any markings is facing down onto the carbon side of your carbon paper and using your tracing wheel you're simply going to mark on the same markings that you completed previously and that will take these through to the other side of your fabric. And that's the method I like to use. I like to do one side, take off my pattern piece and do the other. And I tend to do all one side of all of my pieces first, remove all of the pattern pieces together, and then return to the carbon paper to do the other side. So I'm sort of doing it as a batch. If you perhaps don't have any carbon paper, then another way that you can mark the notches on your pattern is to clip into them. You will, however, still need to complete some thread tracing to mark your darts. To clip into them, you need to take a pair of scissors and cut through all of the layers, the two layers of fabric and the paper pattern, into the point of the notch or the V. I tend to like to cut these in little snips rather than to actually cut the V of the triangle out because I find that it won't fray so much this way. You will then end up with some little snipped areas that you can match up to one another. Now, the only time I wouldn't recommend to do this is if you're planning on overlocking this point. If you have an overlocker and you're planning on overlocking your edges of the fabric, you will find that obviously you can still get some fraying here and it just doesn't look that neat if you overlock this with the snips. 
and obviously you won't be able to find them easily. So I tend to work with the carbon paper if I'm using an overlocker. If you're planning on finishing your edges or your seam allowances without the use of an overlocker or with a zigzag stitch, then this is still absolutely fine because you'll be trimming down some of the seam allowance. As you can see with the carbon paper, I used a black carbon paper here. But another thing to point out is that I probably would have used white if it wasn't that I wanted it to be really clear on the video. You want to use a colour that you can see, but that is as closest to the fabric colour as possible, so that you can't see it from the right side. Also, because we're not lining this, you will find that you would have to wash it for it to come out. So it does come out with washing, but obviously it will be visible on the inside of your fabric. Now, once you've marked your fabric and the pattern pieces have been removed, the first thing that you're going to need to do is to sew the darts. Now, you should have four darts in total, two on the front piece and one on each of the back pieces. You're going to want to pin them before you sew them. I like to pin mine so that it's easy for me to sew. So I personally like to pin on the drawn line that we did in the carbon paper, or if that's thread tracing, on your thread traced line. I also like to think about the direction that my fabric is going to go through the sewing machine. The bulk of the fabric is always going to be on the left as you take it through the machine. So you want to make sure that you're sewing from the largest part of the darts to the apex or the point. Therefore I position my pin so that the head of the pin is facing me and easy for me to remove. You also may want to put a stopping pin across your stopping marking so that you know where to stop. As I mentioned, we have a specific tutorial that will share with you how to do this and how to get a professional result with your darts. I would recommend that you watch that so that you can sew and press your darts properly and join me back here when you've done that. Now you can see here that I've sewn and pressed all of my darts, which is starting to give a bit of a 3D shape to the skirt. The other thing that I've done is to use the overlock to finish the edges. And I've done this on the back edge and all of the side edges of the skirt. Now I've put these through the overlocker and made sure that I did not cut off any of the seam allowance. Now this is important because you don't want to affect the size of the seam allowance. So you either need to run it through the overlocker without cutting any of the material or you need to remove your blade. Now, if you don't have an overlocker, I would recommend that you finish your seams after we have actually sewn the pieces together. And I would recommend that you complete a little zigzag stitch and trim it down to help prevent fraying. If you haven't completed that before, we again have a tutorial on how to do that, and we'll put a link to that in the description box below. But I will let you know when I would like you to finish your seams. But if you're working with an overlocker, I personally like to do that now. So side seams and back seams. And I have also finished the vent like so. Now it's time to sew the two side seams of the skirt together. One thing to point out is that if you had completed the overlocking, you can actually trim all of your overlocking threads back. And the sort of the rule I use when overlocking is that if where you've overlocked is going to be sewn into another seam, for example, along the top edge is going to be sewn into the facing, and along the bottom edge is going to be overlocked again once we've created a full circle, then you can trim off the overlocking threads. If, like the thread here, they're not going to be sewn into a seam, then you need to leave them long as tails, and I will show you how we thread them back through the overlocking to create a neat finish. Now, to sew the two side seams together, you're going to need to position the two back pieces onto the front piece and you need to put the right sides of the fabric together. You need to match up your side seams, match up the bottom of the seam together. And I personally always like to start at the bottom and sew up. The reason being is that if you get a little bit of discrepancy, it's then going to be at the waistband, which we're going to sew around when we put our facing in. 
if you get discrepancy at the bottom, you're then going to have to try this on at home and try and true the bottom edge of your skirt and make it straight, which is more difficult. So you're going to match up the two edges perfectly, match the bottom edge up, and you're then going to work your way up matching the edges together and matching up any notches. I like to think about the way my fabric's going to go through the sewing machine. So I'm always going to have the bulk of the fabric on the left. I'm sewing from the hem up. So therefore my pins need to go in this direction so that the hem of the pin is facing me and therefore easy for me to remove. And as you work your way up the side of the skirt, you want to match up the top edge and position in your pin, going in the same direction. You want to make sure that you match your notches, whether this be a snip, a tailor's tack, or the carbon paper. Until you've positioned pins in the whole of the row and that you're really happy that it's pinned and ready for you to sew. Now again, if you would prefer to baste or tack this by hand first, you're more than welcome to do so. The other thing to point out, as you can see here, is that I personally like to position my pins in as I'm going to be sewing the garment, so parallel to my stitching line. And I like to do that in the seam allowance. This is one of those things that sort of best practice again, and it makes sure that you don't ever sort of catch anything with the pin or damage your fabric. Now we're ready to sew the first of the side seams. However, I like to pin the second side seam so that I'm ready to sew both of them when I get to the sewing machine. Now we need to think about the rules again. We want to sew this from the hem up and we also want to think about having the bulk of the fabric on the left of the sewing machine so that we don't have, it doesn't get in the way of sort of the smaller part of the sewing machine. So what we need to do is we actually need to turn this over and you can see the pins that I've put in along this edge. Again, the head of the pin is facing towards me so that it's easy for me to remove. And I've started at the bottom. I've matched up the two edges and I've matched up the top of the skirt and all of the notches. Put my pins in around in the seam allowance and now I'm ready to go to the sewing machine so that I can sew this. Now we want to start sewing at the hem of the skirt along the side seam. The head of the pins are facing us and we're going to be taking them out as we go. Now, you want to complete a standard straight stitch with a stitch length of 2.5 millimetres, which is what you should have used for the darts too. Now, the needle is in our fabric and the foot is down. When you want to start sewing, you want to start about a quarter of an inch, five millimetres from the edge of the fabric. This is because otherwise the machine might find it difficult to start sewing if you start right on the edge of the fabric, unless you're working with a walking foot. We're going to start by completing a back stitch, two to three stitches forwards, and two to three stitches backwards. There we go. And now we're going to remove our pins as we sew, sewing along the whole of the side seam. And we just want to check all of the time that the edge of our fabric here is on our marking for 5 eighths, 1.5 centimeters, which is what the seam allowance is for this skirt. So you shouldn't be watching the needle, you should simply be watching the 5 eighths, 1.5 centimeter marking. And take it slow, there's no need to rush. Now, if you perhaps are new to sewing and you're finding this a little bit difficult, one thing that may help are one of these magnetic seam guides. You can pop that on, on the marking for 5 eighths, 1.5 centimeters. And then all you need to do is run the edge of your fabric along the edge of the guide. You never want the fabric to roll up onto the guide, it needs to be flat, but it can help if you are new to sewing and finding sewing a straight line accurately difficult. You want to continue all the way along the whole length of the seam. And when you get to the end, again, you're going to backstitch, keeping it to a minimum two to three stitches. Now I've sewn both of the side seams, removing the pins as I did so. 
If you find it difficult to sew in a straight line or to follow the 5 8 1.5 centimeters accurately and you don't have a magnetic seam guide, then another thing that you could do is to actually draw this on with some chalk or a removable pen. Draw on your stitching line and then sew along the drawn line. Once you have sewn the two seams, we're going to do some pressing. The first thing you need to do is to press the seam flat. And this will help to melt the stitches and create a nice professional finish. Using steam, press the whole length of the seam nice and flat. Once you've pressed the seam flat, you're then going to need to press it open to give a really nice finish to your skirt. Now, what I'm going to be using is a seam roll or a sleeve roll. And what this will do is it will help me to get a nice finish along the length of my skirt. Because it's curved, you'll find that you don't end up embossing the seam allowances onto the right side of your fabric. Take the iron and use steam again to nicely press the seam allowance open. Now you may find, depending on how curved you are from the waist to the hip, that it's actually difficult to press this area flat. So another useful tool is to purchase a ham, a pressing ham. And what we're going to use is use the side of the ham to actually get the shape of the curve correct as we press this seam allowance open. We're going to pop the ham under the fabric. You can now use the shape of the ham to actually press the seam from the hip to the waist nice and flat. And we're just using the edge of the ham here. Once the side seams have been sewn and pressed, then you're welcome to finish those. If you're not using an overlocker, I would recommend that you finish those now. And you can follow our tutorial, we'll put a link to that in the description box below, that will show you how to complete a small zigzag and then trim down the seam allowances slightly to help prevent any fraying. Now, if you are using an overlocker, I would recommend that you overlock the bottom edge now, as it's currently one straight edge before you join up the back seam. It just gives you a nicer, more professional look this way, rather than having to finish it as a circle. Again, if you don't have an overlocker and you're using the other technique with the zigzag, you can leave this for now. I will let you know when you need to finish the bottom hem. Now, if you're working with an overlocker, you may find that you have a couple of overlocking tails that need to be finished. Now, the only time that you really need to finish these is when they won't be going into another seam. So, the side seams that you overlocked at the bottom of the skirt came into the bottom seam overlocking. The side seams that you overlocked at the top of the skirt will be sewn over when you attach the facing. So, you should only have a couple of these that you need to finish. One at the edge along the bottom here, and perhaps another one where the vent is. Take a needle with a large eye. You will need to cut and potentially wet the end of the overlocking thread so that you can thread it through the needle. You're then going to take the needle and thread it back up through the overlocking. And it doesn't matter which way, whether you thread it back up the vent or whether you go along the, um, the inside of the hem. And I tend to do this on the wrong side of my fabric so that it's nicely hidden. And then you can pull it through. Like so. And then we're simply going to take a pair of scissors and trim it off here. And that should give you a nice, neat finish, and it means that it won't come undone anytime soon. So as I said, you will have one at the bottom edge of the skirt, and if you're completing a vent, you may have another one along your vent. Next step is to attach the zip into the back of the skirt. 
As we mentioned at the start of the video, we're going to be working with an invisible zip for this tutorial. I promise that as a beginner, you will get better results sewing an invisible zip than you will from sewing a standard zip. The visible zip we're using here is nine inches long. And as always, I like to, like to prepare the right side of my skirt fabric by drawing onto it with chalk. I like to draw on the stitching line, which is the line we're going to use to line up our invisible zipper. And I measure from the edge of my fabric, the seam allowance of 5 eighths, 1.5 centimeters, and draw that all the way down the back seam of the skirt. I also then will measure from the top edge of the skirt down three quarters of an inch or one inch, which is two centimeters or 2.5 centimeters. And this is gonna be the starting point for the top of the zip and provides enough space for you to get a neat finish at the top edge here once you've attached the facing. The difference between the three quarters of an inch or one inch depth would just be a little bit more room for you to add a hook and eye afterwards. So it's up to you, whichever you would prefer. Now I would recommend that you watch our specific invisible zipper tutorial, as this will provide a much more detailed approach to putting the invisible zipper into your garment. Also want to make sure that you do actually purchase an invisible zipper. So again, referring to that video, I will show you what an invisible zipper looks like. Now the most important thing when sewing an invisible zipper is that you must put the zip into the seam before sewing up the bottom or top of the seam. So we're going to be positioning the zip in first. Now you want to make sure that you match up with the top drawn chalk line, the little plastic bit for the top of the zip. I tend to put the plastic bit just below the drawn line. I'm also matching up the teeth of the zipper onto the drawn line for your seam allowance. Again, the tutorial on how to sew an invisible zip will show this in greater detail. And it will also show how to make sure that you're getting the zip in straight. You want to put the teeth of the zip facing inside of the garment and the right side of the zip facing the right side of the fabric so that when this is finished, it will look like so. You will need to pin and sew one side of this prior to then pinning and sewing the other side. You're welcome to baste or tack them in if you would like to do so. And I do recommend that you do that if you are trying to match any plaid or patterns. So I'm going to go away and sew my zip into my skirt. And as I mentioned, please do watch the tutorial on how to do this if you are new to sewing an invisible zipper, or if you just want a refresher. Join me back here when you've sewn both the left and right side of the zip and I'm going to share with you how we sew up the bottom of the skirt. Once you've introduced your invisible zipper and you're happy with the finish, you'll want to sew the seam below the skirt from the bottom of the skirt or the vent to the bottom of the zipper. Now you can see from the inside of the skirt I've sewn up the seam at the bottom of the zip and I made sure that I sewed just past the zip here. And if you would followed our invisible zipper tutorial, I would, it would share with you how to do this and make sure that you're sewing as close to the zip as possible. If you were making a skirt without a vent, you would simply sew up the bottom of the back seam of the skirt from the bottom of the hem to the bottom of the zip. If you are making a skirt with a back vent, you would need to make sure that you sewed from the point here, which is the circle that we marked. This is where the vent begins. And you would make, need to make sure that you reinforce this with back stitch. The back seam of the skirt would follow the same seam allowance of 1.5 centimeters, 5 eighths of an inch from the edge of the fabric. You can now see once that's complete that I've nicely pressed this open. I personally like to press open using the same seam roll that we used for the side seams, the back 
seam of the skirt. And I tend to do this below the zip. I don't like to press the zip in too much because I find that this can emboss the zip onto the right side of the fabric. To finish the bottom of the zip, I neatly attached the end of the zip to each of the seam allowances. And again, this is covered in the Invisible Zipper tutorial. Once you've sewn up the back seam and you don't have an overlocker, I would recommend that you finish the edges of the seam allowance using either the zigzag or the overcast stitch on your sewing machine. I would recommend that you do the same for the edges of your vent and for the hem of the skirt. The next job is to finish the vent at the bottom of the skirt. And we're going to do that by mitering the corners. This is going to give us a really professional look. We're going to do something different on the front of the vent to the back panel of the vent. And then I'm going to show you how to actually finish the stitching from the right side of the skirt. And that will finish our back seam if you're completing a skirt with a vent. So the first step is going to be to press up your hem. Now the hem for this skirt is two and a quarter inches, which is 5.7 centimeters. You're going to want to work from the bottom edge and press up the required amount and put some pins in. And just make sure that you measure accurately with a ruler as you're doing this. Now for the vent, my skirt is currently inside out. So I'm working with it inside out and it's the vent on the right that I'm going to be working with because both of these are going to be completed in a slightly different way. So with the vent on the right, you've pressed up to the inside, the hem allowance. You're then going to press the vent along the line, which is the crease for the vent. So we've got it nicely pressed like so. Now, taking a sharp pair of scissors, we're going to cut into this corner here through everything. just like so. So right into that little corner, but through everything. So through the layers of the vent and through the layers of the hem allowance. Obviously not through the right side of our skirt. Once you've snipped into the little corner here, through the layers of the vent and the hem allowance, you're going to open this bag out. Okay. Then, with this piece, you're going to now fold the fabric right side together. So this is our right side. We were looking at it like this. We've opened it out. Right sides together, we are going to match the little clip here to the little clip here, okay? So you've got one clip that was on your um, hem allowance and another clip that was on the vent. So the top clip there to the bottom clip here need to match together with the fabric right sides together. And you may need to undo a few of your pins and pull the hem allowance down so that you can get this in a way that you can work with it. So we need to match those up accurately and pop a pin in. Now we've matched up our two clips here and we're going to draw a line with a ruler and some chalk from the two clips to the creased corner that you can see here. You should still be able to see the dotted line. That was the fold of the vent and the line going this way is our hem allowance. And we're going to be sewing from there to there. If I just roughly put some pins in and aim to turn this around for you, hopefully you can see what we're aiming for, just so that it makes sense. So. That's sort of the line we're going to be working on. I'll draw that accurately in a second. If we turn this around, we're aiming for something like that. A really, really neat mitered corner to our vent. Taking a ruler, chalk, or a removal pen, you want to draw a line from the two clips to the corner, which you can tell by the pressed lines here. 
And I would recommend that you put some pins along that line. But it's just good to have a guide for sewing at the machine to make sure that this is truly accurate. Now again, working from the inside of the garment to finish the vent on the left. Now this is the vent that's going to be closest to the inside of the skirt. Now to finish this, I've already finished the edge of mine with the overlocker. And I would recommend that if you don't have an overlocker, you finish the edge with an overcast or a zigzag stitch. And then you just want to press over an edge towards the inside by about a quarter of an inch, five millimeters. I've already been around and pressed up my hem allowance, so I've got a nice crease where that will finish. And if I fold this up like so now, with the two, this little edge tucked in, I should get a nice finish. So with this side, you're simply going to stitch, edge stitch, down the edge about one eighth, three millimeters away from the edge. And I'm just going to pop some pins in there to hold it. And then you can join me at the sewing machine and I will show you how to do this. So you're just gonna have a nice little row of stitching along this edge that's going to hold the hem allowance up and hold the overlocking or the overcast stitches back out of view. Now to sew the underside of the vent, you want to stitch one eighth, three millimeters away from the edge here. I've got a nice little nook on my foot that I can line up with the edge of the fabric to make sure that I'm sewing one eighth away. You want to start right at the bottom and you want to make sure that you back stitch and try and make this as neat as possible. The other thing to think about is that the hem side, which is underneath, wants to be ever so slightly hidden, so it can be a little bit further back than the side we see from the front. You may need to use the hand wheel to get started, or perhaps a walking foot if you have one, because you're working with a small amount of fabric. Run this through the machine, keeping you try and keep accurate with the 1-8, three millimeters from the edge, and back stitch when you get to the end. For mitering the vents, you're going to need to sew along the drawn line. You want to back stitch at the start and you're going to be using a standard stitch with a stitch length of 2.5 millimeters. Simply stitch along the drawn line, removing the pins as you go and be sure to back stitch when you get to the edge here as well to make sure that it's nice and secure. You may even need to just sew off the fabric to make sure that you've really got that nice corner. Once you've sewn the mitered corner of the vent, you may want to just turn it around to the right side to check that you're happy with it because we're now going to cut off this remaining bit of fabric. So this sort of triangle that's sitting to the inside of your seam. So if we turn this through here, That's looking great. So we're going to cut off this extra bit here, basically, this inside bit. And we're going to cut this a quarter of an inch, five millimeters from your stitching line. You want to take a small, sharp pair of scissors and make sure that you only cut through this. This is the time to be careful. You don't want to cut through your skirt too. If you have access to a point press, it's a really great idea to actually press open the seam allowance that we have just cut from the inside of our mitered vent. You may want to actually trim down with a pair of scissors at this top edge, because that's currently sitting at a fold, so that it will completely open up. Using an iron, press the seam allowances open. You may find when you turn this around that there's still a little bit too much bulk in this corner here. So you may want to sort of cut these off to give a more angled finish, which will help to reduce the bulk in that corner. 
Once you're happy with this, you can turn the mitre around to the right side. You'll really need to get in to poke the corner out. If you've got a, a point turner or anything, you can, re you can use that, or be careful with a pair of scissors. And make sure that you're really happy with the finished point and edge of your mitre. Just like so. You now want to give this a nice finished press, nice and flat, to make sure that everything is as it should be. Press your mitered corner nice and flat, and the same for the underside of the vent, so that you've got a good finish. I'm now going to show you how to finish sewing the vents across the top edge to hold them in position from the right side of the garment. Now we need to stitch across the vent to hold everything in place. Now you can do this from the wrong side, but I prefer to do it from the right side of the garment because I feel that that's what's important. That's what will be seen from the front of the garment. Therefore, I need to take the line and there's a line like so going underneath my two vents here. And all I've done is use my pins to make sure that I'm putting them exactly on the line. And that was the chalk line that I would have marked in one of the first steps. And I've simply positioned the pins on that line and pinned through the two vents and the one layer of fabric for the back of the skirt. Now from the right side of the skirt, this is the top of the vent. And you can see the pins that I've used as my marking. Now, if you didn't want to use pens, you could use a little bit of thread and a needle and actually sort of give yourself a bit of a running stitch so that you can find this marking. And then I've actually drawn this on and I've used, you could use some chalk, I've used a removable pen. This one comes off with air over time or it can be removed by the pen itself. And so I've simply drawn that along, knowing my starting point and my ending point. And obviously I'd recommend you use a ruler to make sure that this is nice and straight. And I find that by drawing this onto the right side of my fabric, I know that it's going to be accurate and that when I sew this, I'm sewing it from the right side. So now I know that I can get it perfect. Once you've drawn it on, you're going to want to pin the vents together. And obviously you can remove these pins because these are going to be in the way of your sewing otherwise. Now I've pinned it in place, I've made certain that I've pinned everything nice and flat from the wrong side and that I'm holding the two vents ready to sew at the machine. Now if you'd like to join me at the sewing machine, I will share with you how I actually sew the vents in place. Now I'm getting ready to sew along my drawn line which will hold my vent in position. Now what I like to do is I like to start on the point that lines up with my back seam. And I'm actually going to position my needle into the fabric on the back seam. And I'm going to stitch along my drawn line. I will back stitch at the start and I will back stitch at the end, but you will need to keep them to a minimum. And I'm talking one to two stitches here. You could perhaps pull your threads through to the wrong side and tie them off instead. Now I'm going to line this up and it might take a little bit of trial and error to make sure I'm in the right place and I'm going to use the hand wheel to position my needle into the fabric and I'm a little bit too far forward so I'm going to simply move that ever so slightly until I'm really happy that my needle is entering the skirt on the back seam. Now I'm going to stitch a couple of stitches forwards and a couple of stitches backwards. And you can always use the hand wheel to walk this if you would prefer. And then you can check your accuracy. Once I'm happy, I'm going to simply sew along the drawn line. making sure that everything's nice and flat as I go, take the pins out if they get in your way, and when I get to the end, I'm going to do exactly the same 
two stitches backwards and a couple of stitches forwards to fasten it off. And again, use the hand wheel if you need to. And then you have your finished working vent with a beautiful mitered corner. I removed any of the pins and removed the pen that I was working with and trimmed the threads. And by doing it on the right side, you do find that you get a really neat professional finish. To achieve a flatter finish with the seam allowance coming down the back of the skirt, you'll want to cut into the corner here using a sharp pair of scissors. This would allow you to press the seam allowance above this point open and leave the rest of the seam allowance as it is at the bottom of the vent. Be careful that you don't cut too far and make sure that this area is reinforced by a backstitch. The next thing that you will need to do is to interface the facing, the front piece and the two back pieces. Now we discussed our interfacing options at the start of the tutorial and as I mentioned I'm working with a lightweight woven interfacing. Because I'm working with a woven interfacing I need to make sure that I cut out my pieces on the same grain line on the interfacing that I did with the original fabric. So as you can see I've positioned them on and I tend to like to pin them on ready to cut out an iron. So my, my fabric pieces have the right side facing up. So I position them wrong side down onto the rough textured side of the interfacing. So you'll always have the sticky side of the interfacing. Um, on a lot of fabrics it's rather rough, on others it can be a little bit shiny, and that's going to be the side that you're going to stick to the wrong side of your fabric. So I've pinned mine together and I've made sure that the grain line the grain line was in the centre of my centre front and the centre back and I made sure that that is correct with the selvage of my interfacing. You don't have to be as precise as you were with the fabric. Um, I sometimes won't measure them, I'll sort of just put them on my eye and make sure that it's okay but as long as you're, you're you know, almost correct then you will be fine. If you're working with a non-woven interfacing, so an interfacing that's made from a pulp, it won't have a grain and therefore you don't need to worry about placing your pattern pieces on the same grain line. As you can see, I've cut around my fabric pieces to cut them out of the interfacing. Just like we did with our main fabric, you want to try and keep everything nice and flat and cut as close to the fabric as possible. Now you want to bond the interfacing onto the fabric. Now I always like to do this with the wrong side of my interfacing facing up. Now the reason being is that the sticky side of the interfacing is facing onto the wrong side of my fabric here. And if it stretches ever so slightly or perhaps you hadn't cut it super neat and on the edge and some interfacing were to go over onto your ironing board, the sticky side of the interfacing would get onto the ironing board and not onto the bottom of your iron. You want to take out the pins as you go so as to not emboss them into the fabric and you can do this flat on your ironing board. You want to add heat and steam. In terms of how long to keep the iron onto the, the interfacing. It does depend on the interfacing you're working with and you should find a guideline in the border of the interfacing on whether you require heat and steam or just heat and how long it requires you to keep the iron on it for it to stick. If you don't have anything in the border or you don't know, I recommend working with about 10 seconds. But you could always test this on a scrap first to make sure that you don't damage your main fabric and that the interfacing is bonded well. Now you want to check that you've really bonded the interfacing onto your fabric and that it's not going to come off. Because with wash and wear, if it's not bonded correctly, you may find that it does start to peel off. Now you may find that the interfacing has stretched or shifted slightly as you are ironing it on and that you've now got a slight edge of interfacing peeking out around the fabric. If you do, you can simply just trim that away, it's not a problem.
The other thing to think about here is that can you still see the markings that you made to your fabric? Luckily I can. My markings were made with black carbon paper and I can actually see them through my interfacing. But if you can't, you would need to reposition the paper pattern onto your pieces and re-mark them. Again, if you'd use the little cutting or snipping technique, you would probably be able to see your snips. And if you were completing thread tracing or tailor's tacks, I tend to try and interface things first before doing so, because otherwise you can find that they're difficult to remove when they're stuck in with the interfacing. Now again, I'm working with the overlocker, so I've gone ahead and I've overlocked the side seam, the back seam of the back, the two back pieces and the side seams of the front piece. If you're working with an overlock, you can do that now. You can also trim off your overlocking tails because these don't need to be threaded back inside because they're going to be, we're going to be finishing both the top edge and the bottom edge of the facing. If you don't have an overlocker and you're planning on finishing this with a zigzag stitch, then please wait and I will share with you when to finish your seams. You're better to do them when you've sewn the seam for accuracy. If you're working with an overlocker, just like we did with the skirt, you want to remove the blade or make sure that you don't cut off any of your seam allowance. Now we need to sew the side seams together for our facing. So we need to put our fabric pieces right sides together. The back needs to be going right sides together onto the front facing. Now, how do you know which is the side seam of our back facing? Well, the best way, if you're really stuck and you don't know, the best way is to refer back to your original pattern piece. So you can do this throughout the construction of any item. If you're not sure, refer back to your original pattern piece because it should tell you where the center back is. So we know that the two notches are closest to the center back and the side seam should have one notch on it. So if we check out this, we've got my notch on the side seam here and my two notches are closest to my center back, just like so. Just like with the skirt, we want to make sure that we're consistent when we sew this. So we're going to be sewing this from the bottom to the top again, because the top's going to be sewn onto the skirt. So we want to make sure the bottom edge is nice and flat and in line. Therefore, we're going to think about the way this is going to go through the sewing machine before we pin it. We want to have the bulk of our fabric on the left, and we're going to be pinning, or sewing, should I say, from the bottom to the top. So we want to pin these two edges with the point of the pin facing the bottom. We want to make sure we've matched up our two notches and that you've matched up the two edges nice and neatly and the bottom and the top edge. Just a couple of pins in here will be fine. For the other side, we need to think about how we're going through the sewing machine. Bulk of the fabric on the left, so we need to turn this over so that we've got bulk of fabric on the left, sewing from the bottom of the facing to the top. Again, matching our edges, matching our notches and the bottom and the top of the facing. And then you can join me at the sewing machine and we will sew this together. Now I'm sewing the side seam of the facing together from the bottom edge of the facing to the top edge. With the bulk of the material on my left, I'm following the 5 8 1.5 centimeter seam allowance. And you can use a magnetic seam guide if you would like. Or if you don't have one of these and you're struggling to follow the markings on your machine, how about taping it on with a little bit of masking tape or even drawing on your stitching line using a ruler and some chalk or a removable pen. Start with the needle down and we back stitch to start. Two to three stitches forwards, two to three stitches backwards, and we sew up, taking the pins out as we go to the top edge where we also back stitch. Perfect, and you're going to do that for both of the side seams. As you can see, I have sewn the two side seams of my facing together and I pressed the seam allowances flat and then open as we completed for the side seams of the skirt. If you don't have an overlocker and you wish to finish 
the edges of your fabric with a zigzag or an overcast stitch. You can do so now. However, it isn't the most important thing here because the facing will be hidden and attached to the skirt. So you won't see this like you will the side seams of the skirt. The same goes for the back seam here. I really would, wouldn't worry about finishing the back seam as this will be hidden from view when it's hand stitched into the inside of the skirt. One thing I would recommend finishing is the bottom edge and you can see that I've done that with the overlocker here. I've gone along the bottom edge, I haven't cut off any of the fabric, so either remove the blade or be certain that you're not trimming anything off as you overlock along the bottom edge. Make sure that the seam allowances are pressed open as you overlock through. I tend to like to overlock this with the seam allowance facing up like you see here so that I can check that this is sitting nice and flat and open and isn't caught one way or the other. I've also tucked away my tails at both of the ends. If you don't have an overlocker, you can finish the bottom edge now as well. I would recommend completing a zigzag or an overcast stitch. You can follow the tutorial to our zigzag stitch in the description box below. When completing the zigzag stitch, you can't do it right on the edge of the fabric. So I would recommend sewing about one centimeter, three eighths from the edge of the fabric, and then you will need to trim this down. That's not a problem at all. It would just slightly reduce the width of the facing, which really isn't a problem. But it will be a good idea to finish the bottom edge of this to prevent fraying. And make sure that you're finishing the bottom larger edge, not the edge with the notches on. Now it is time to attach the facing to the waistband of the skirt. The first thing that we need to do is to take the skirt to the sewing machine and we're going to need to complete what's referred to in the pattern manual as an e-stitch around the top edge of the waistband. We're going to do this in the seam allowance and an e-stitch is a large stitch length on the sewing machine, four millimeters, that will allow us to pull on the stitch to shrink the waistband to fit the facing that is smaller. Join me at the sewing machine and I will share with you how we do this. It doesn't matter whether you sew the stitch with the right side or the wrong side of the skirt facing up. I would recommend that you move the zipper away or open it out from the skirt so that everything is nice and flat. Now I tend to like to do this in the seam allowance, especially here because we haven't got a large amount of ease that we're going to need to absorb. So you don't necessarily need to do it on the seam. I would recommend that you do it in the seam allowance so that it's easy to remove afterwards. Therefore, I'm going to be doing this using a one centimeter, three eighths seam allowance. You want to make sure that you're completing a straight stitch on your sewing machine and you want to change the stitch length to four millimeters or a longest stitch that your machine will do. You do not want to back stitch for this. And you're going to simply work your way around the waistband edge of the skirt, sewing one centimeter three eighths away from the top edge using the four millimeter easing stitch. You want to make sure that as you sew over your darts and your seam allowances, that they stay in the way they should be pressed. So the seam allowances should be open and the darts we pressed towards the side seams of the body. Again, when you get to the end, you do not want to back stitch. You want to leave long tails so that we can pull on these tails to shrink up the skirt waistband to fit the facing. To make sure that you get an even gather, you want to complete another row of the easing stitch, four millimeter straight stitch length, in between the previous stitch and the edge of the fabric at the waistline. And this will help to make sure that you get what's called an even gather or easing. Again, do not back tack. Now you want to take the two tails, one from each of the stitches, and you want to take two from either the front or the back of the stitch. It doesn't matter which, as long as you pull the two from the same side. And when you pull on these, you should pull up the fabric like so. 
the tighter the pu you pull, the more fabric that you get pulled up. You then want to move this around the waistband of the skirt. And this is what you would use for whenever a pattern refers to gathering or easing. Gathering is just more of this. Easing means there's only a small amount. And you're simply going to move this around the waistband of the skirt, pulling in more as and when you require it. You're going to do some from one side of the zip and some from the other side of the zip so that you can evenly distribute this around the waistband of the skirt. Now, once you've started to ease up some of the skirt waistband, you can start to position the facing onto the skirt. You want to match these right sides together, so the right side of the facing to the right side of the skirt. And you want to start by matching up the side seams. You can then work your way around the front piece of the facing and the skirt, matching up any notches, and you want to distribute the ease. So just moving it along to make sure that they fit together. There won't be a lot of ease because this is easing, not gathering, but there will be a little bit that needs to be absorbed. Now you can see here, I've got a few little ridges in the fabric. And obviously you don't want to sew any of these in. I tend to use my nails and I sort of flick at them to make sure that they go away and become absorbed. And the key here really is, is to learn to manipulate. You really can sort of stretch and move the fabric so that you can get it to go together, matching the notches or the side seams where you need to. Working now from the side seam to the centre back, you can see that I've eased in my waistband, but actually I don't need as much ease as this because my facing is actually larger. So I can pull a little bit of that out until I can get them to fit. So the best thing is to really get, get them the same size first. Now with my right side to right side, I'm going to open up the parts at the zip here and position them flat together. And again, I'm pinning where I'm going to be sewing. So along the top edge in my seam allowance of 5 8 1.5 centimeters. By the looks of it, the facing is still a little bit bigger than the waistband, so I can still push out a little bit of that easing to make them the same size. Once they're the same size, I can match my notches. And I tend to like to do this from my facing side, um, really because generally speaking, you want to put the side that needs easing on the bed of the machine. So the waistband needs to be eased into the facing, so that needs to go onto the bed of the machine so that the feed dogs on the machine move that through slightly quicker. And you, you just want to manipulate them together. So I'm giving a little bit of stretch, stretching to make sure that they go nicely together and so that they fit. So the top edge at the waistband is fitting. And again, if you get any sort of little pleats or anything, you just want to use your nails, use your fingers to really distribute those so that, that you won't have any when it's actually being sewn. Before we go to, his, to the sewing machine, the other thing that's really important is that the facing side seam matches the side seam of the skirt. Now I have a little trick that I use to make sure that these are accurate all of the time. And that is these clover fork pins. We're going to position that into the fabric and make sure that it stays where it should. So what we need to do first off is to match them up ourselves. So by peeking in, you just want to make sure that they're nicely matched up. Then you want to take your clover fork pin. You always want to put these in with the rounded end sitting up. The rounded end needs to be sitting up when you're sewing because the machine won't like to take that with it flat and down like so. You want the two pointy edges to be going out towards the seam as well. 
So we check that we have matched them up. Take the clover pin, put either of the legs, either side of your seam you're trying to match. The pointed edge is going out towards the seam allowance edge. If you're planning on using a magnetic seam guide, you want to make sure that you do not push these over because they'll be caught on your guide. They need to therefore be in line with the edge of the fabric. And you also need to make sure that where you're putting this in is at about the stitching line. So it is at about the 1.5 centimeter, five eighths from the edge of your fabric. And once it's in, you can give it a double check. You can peek and have a little look. Is that matched up? If it isn't, not a problem. Just reposition it and try again. Once you have got them matched up, you can actually leave these in. And they're the only pins that I would suggest you can leave in whilst you sew. I find that because you've got the two legs, that if you ever were to hit one of them, it sort of moves out the way because they do sort of budge ever so slightly. But they're fabulous at helping you to match seams. Now, if you are a complete beginner, I would probably recommend that you take a needle and thread and you actually just hand sew. So baste or tack the facing onto the skirt as a starting point, because then you can remove your pins and you know that everything will run smoothly. Otherwise, you can join me at the sewing machine and I'll show you how we sew this. Now it's time to join the face into the skirt and we're going to be sewing 5 eighths 1.5 centimeters from the top edge. You're welcome to use the magnetic seam guide if you would like. One area where you need to be accurate is over the top of the zip here. When we sew over this we need to make sure we're doing the same on both sides so that it's symmetrical when you actually zip up your zip. If you would like to draw on the stitching line, you're welcome to do so, and I would recommend using chalk, a removable fabric pen, and a ruler. Start with the zip folded out like so, just as we pinned, and be sure to stitch a couple of stitches forwards, a couple of stitches backwards to secure the seam. Taking the pins out as you go, you want to sew around the curve of the waistband. And you want to make sure that you are consistently accurate with your seam allowance, which is why, as I said, you are welcome to draw your stitching line on or perhaps even baste or tack this first. You must make sure that everything is going in the right direction. When I refer to everything, I mean your darts are going in the right direction and the seam allowances are pressed open and that they don't get caught. So I'm coming up to my seam allowances here and I'm just checking on both sides that they're nicely pressed open. And as you go through, you'll just want to check that. If you find it gets caught a little bit, then all you would do, needle in, lift up your presser foot and push the seam allowance flat again. And again, if you find this difficult, you can use the hand wheel to walk forwards a little bit. Over the clover fork pins, you're simply going to sew over those and just be careful and keep it slow when you go over those. You also want to be careful and make sure that you aren't sewing in any pleats or tucks on the waistband. And you will get used to feeling for this. I'm constantly feeling for this. Um, I generally sort of have one of my hands, generally my right hand, sort of feeling at the start of the machine to check that everything is in order. And then I'm feeling again with my left hand that everything's nice and flat. Now, if you feel any lumps and bumps, Again, you can just use your fingers or nails to sort of get rid of those and to make sure that everything is as it should be. And you're going to complete this all the way around the top of the waistband. You must make sure that you are sewing this again using a straight stitch and 2.5 millimeter stitch length. Once you've sewn the facing onto the skirt, you just want to check that you haven't caught any of the skirt anywhere. If you have, you may need to unpick a few stitches and go over this, but you may find that by pressing it or by using your fingers, you can actually manipulate out the pleat or the tuck. You also want to check that you're happy with the side seams that you matched up. Once you're happy with that, you're then going to need 
to trim your seam allowances. Now, the pattern asked you to trim the seam allowances, and this is something that's often referred to as well as grading. Now, what you're going to need to do for this is you're going to need to trim one seam allowance smaller than the other seam allowance. This is going to reduce the bulk in the top of the skirt and just give you a more professional finish. So you must always reduce the seam allowance of the facing smaller than the body of the skirt. Now, the best way to think about this is when this is finished, so when your facing is on the inside of your skirt, the seam allowance that's closest to the inside of the body must be smaller. So this is our skirt, this is the outside, our facing on the inside of the body, that needs to be the smallest one. So I've gone along and trimmed my facing down to one eighth, three millimeters away from my stitching line. And you'll want to use a nice small sharp pair of scissors for this. Now I will also need to trim down the skirt seam allowance, and I'm going to do this to about a quarter of an inch, five millimeters away from the stitching line, or double the distance that I trimmed for the facing seam allowance. So I'm just going to grab a small pair of scissors and simply work my way along the waistband doing this. The key is to just check that you're not cutting through anything else. I like to keep a finger underneath and check what I'm cutting is what I'm supposed to be cutting. And you want to do this all the way along. Now I've trimmed down both of my seam allowance, both the one belonging to the facing and the one belonging to the skirt fabric. The next thing that you're going to need to do is to do something that's referred to as an understitch. Now the pattern hasn't asked you to do this, but I promise that it will provide you with a more professional result. What we're going to do is we're going to move the facing so that we can stitch onto the right side of our facing. But as we start sew onto the right side of our facing, all of the seam allowances are going to be underneath the facing. We're going to be sewing about an eighth, three millimeters, away from the seam that joins the facing to the body of the skirt. But on the facing, catching all of the seam allowances onto it. So as you're threading this through the machine, you're going to need to make sure that you can feel the seam allowances and that they're going towards the facing at all times. And this is just going to help hold the facing in position and to stop it from coming out as you're wearing it or popping back out of the garment. One thing to point out is that you don't need to start right at the end here because this part where the zip is, is going to be folded under like so. You want to start whereabouts the zip finishes, ideally. We're going to pop that in, starting where the zip finishes, and you want to line it up so that you are stitching one eighth, three millimeters away from the seam that joins the facing to the waistband of the skirt. We're doing a standard stitch with a stitch length of 2.5 millimeters. You want to start by putting the needle into the fabric and you do want to backstitch a couple of stitches forwards, a couple of stitches backwards to secure the stitching. Now I like to sort of give this a little bit of a pull so that I'm really pulling the facing away from the waistband of the skirt to make sure that it's sitting nice and flat. The other thing that you need to check is that at all times the seam allowances are sitting underneath the facing and you're simply going to work this all the way around the top facing of the skirt. When you get round to the end, you're going to backstitch to secure the stitching. On finishing the understitch, you want to stop when you get to the start of the zip. Once you finish this, you want to give it a nice press and you want to pull the facing to the inside of the garment and give it a press over your ham or a shaping device. You want to make sure that you can see a sixteenth to an eighth, so one to three millimeters of the front of the skirt from the facing side so that you don't see the facing from the front. 
Now with this, I would all recommend that you press it towards the inside of the garment and then you turn it over. And this is when you can use your ham to actually shape the skirt. So if you've got any little pleats or things that aren't coming out, here you can use the iron and really try and get on top of everything. And just make sure that you're shaping it on your ham or use a towel as the shape of the garment will be on the body. To finish the facing around the zip, you want to fold the seam allowances in for both the zip body of the skirt and the facing. You can always give this a press if you would like to. You then want to fold this down, just like the facing will be around the top of the skirt body, so that you're left with something like this. Now you can actually sew this on the sewing machine. If you wanted to sew this on the sewing machine, what you would need to do would be to fold your facing down on top of the zip, right sides together. You would then stitch the two layers down here. And you would make sure that you did so in the center of the zipper tape. You don't want to go too close to the zipper teeth because you would stop it from being able to be opened. Once you've done that, you would want to use a pair of scissors to cut off the corner and reduce the bulk of the two layers. I would also trim down this part of the facing. If you were new to sewing and perhaps didn't want to do that, then instead I would recommend that you fold it like so and that you complete a small little hand stitch to attach the facing onto the garment. To hand sew the facing down onto the zip. You want to complete a slip stitch or a fell stitch. Thread a needle and tie a knot at the end of your thread. You want to come out of the facing at the very edge, so almost on the folded edge of the facing. You then want to go back into the zip directly above this. In picking up the zipper tape, you can pick up the seam allowance, you just do not want to go through to the right side. You want to go along for about a quarter of an inch, five millimeters, and come back out right on the edge of the fold of the facing again. And you want to continually do this. So my thread has come out of the facing on the folded edge directly above it, going into the zipper tape along for about a quarter of an inch, five millimeters, and coming out right on the edge of the zipper, of the facing again. And you just want to do that for both sides, and that will just hold this on nice and neatly. Now you can see here, this is the top of the zip from the right side. Now I could add a little hook and eye if I wanted to, just behind this but you really don't have to unless you want to. Um, they can be a little bit fiddly, um, so it's really up to you whether you've got the space to add one and whether you want to add one. If you do want to add one, then please follow the link in the description box below to how to sew on a hook and eye. You want to complete a figure of eight tack to attach the facing onto the side seam. Position the pin about half an inch 1.2 centimeters from the bottom of the facing so that you can easily fold it back. I threaded a needle with a double thread and I've tied a knot at the end of it and I've gone through into the facing. I just want to go over that another time for security. Once you've done that, you can then work by going in and out of the seam allowances of the skirt and you want to make sure that you don't go through to the right side, you're just catching the seam allowances. And then in and out of the facing. And again, ideally, you just want to go through the seam allowances and not through to the right side. And you're going to keep doing this. So you've got what's called a figure of eight tack. In and out of the seam allowances of the skirt, in and out of the seam allowances of the facing. And once you feel that this is secure, you can simply tie this off. Finally, you will need to hand sew the hem. I'm completing a herringbone catch stitch. 
and you can follow the link to our tutorial on how to sew this in the description box below. I personally like to have a row of pins along about half an inch, 1.2 centimeters from the top edge of my hem. This would allow me to fold this along these so that I can work my cap stitch in the right place. And you want to try and make this obviously as invisible as possible, making sure you don't pick up too much of your exterior fabric. If you were making a skirt without a vent, you don't necessarily need to hand sew the hem. This is completely up to you and may depend on the fabric that you're working with. If you didn't want to hand sew the hem, you could stitch this on the sewing machine using a straight stitch. But if you were to sew it along this top edge here, it would look like a rather large band at the bottom of the skirt. So what I would recommend doing is to press up the hem allowance of two and a quarter inches, 5.7 centimeters, and then to do what's called a double fold hem. So to fold in the top edge of the hem band into the fold, and then to fold that in again. So you end up with a hem allowance half the size. You could then run this through the machine and stitch along the top edge, about an eighth, three millimeters away from the top edge of the fold. I would recommend that you start and stop at the centre back of the seam so that your back stitches there are hidden from view. And obviously you will see the stitches from the right side, but it will be a much quicker method if you would like to do this. And here we have it, your finished skirt. I really hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and that you feel that you've learned some new things and feel able to perhaps make some other patterns at home now. Thanks for watching.